Welcome to another episode of Tea with Tara, Conversations About Writing. On today's show, we're going to be discussing the life and times of Laura Ingalls Wilder. And I just want to put a few pictures up so that I could show you who Laura Ingalls Wilder was. I'm sure you already know. If you have ever watched the television show, Little House on the Prairie, then you are familiar with Laura Ingalls Wilder. Or if you have read the book series, Little House on the Prairie, then you know her as well. Uh, if you're like me, I was absolutely crazy about the television show, the popular TV show, in the 70s starring Michael Landon and Melissa Gilbert, and I watched it uh, growing up, and I still watch it to this day. It has never been off the air. So today you're in for a real treat because I'll be talking with Marie Bristol, who has worked for the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum, and that's a photograph of the museum right there, the home and museum. And she's going to be giving us a glimpse into the life of this great American pioneer girl. So in just a few moments, we are going to be joined by Marie Bristol. And we're going to be discussing one of the greatest American writers, Laura Ingalls Wilder. So stay tuned. Hi, and welcome back to Tea with Tara, conversations about writing. We are joined by Marie Bristol, who has worked for the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum for many years. Welcome, Ms. Bristol. Thank you, Tara. It's nice to be here. So I want to get started by talking a little about where Laura Ingalls Wilder was born. Okay. Uh, Laura was born in Pippin, Wisconsin. Uh, it's in the upper third of the state. Um, uh, it's very remote. Uh, or it was then uh, in the big woods, of course. But um, I was privileged to go there during our last uh, Laura Palooza that we had in 19. And uh, it was just a lovely time. And of course, the, the big woods aren't there anymore, but I could just imagine the trees being all around the cabin and uh, it being a lovely place to uh, grow up for a few years. Can you talk a little about Laura's family? And of course, we know from the TV show about Ma and Pa, and of course, she, she had siblings, Mary, Carrie, Grace, and I believe a baby brother, Charles. Can you talk a little about her family life and, and what it was like for her growing up? Well, she always had someone to play with because her sister, Mary, uh, was a couple of years older than she. And um, so uh, I think that Mary was probably her best friend growing up. Uh, and then later on, when they were living in um, uh, Kansas, in that little house uh, on the prairie, uh, their, her sister uh, Carrie was born. And then um, Carrie was uh, uh, another playmate for them. And then later on, uh, a brother, Charles, was born, Charles Frederick, as they called him. And uh, he, unfortunately, did not live very long. He, uh, I think it was about nine months or so. Uh, and then uh, he uh, died while they were traveling from um, uh, Plum Creek, while they were traveling from Plum Creek. Creek to Burr Oak, uh, and they had made a stop at uh, uh, Paul's brothers, I think, and he uh, just passed away. And uh, I really don't know why exactly. I read some uh, uh, some opinions, but I uh, I I just really don't know. And then while they were in uh, Burr Oak. Uh, another sister, Grace, was born. And so now there were four girls, but no boys. Poor Pa. <laughs> so they, they moved around a lot. Yes, they did. Uh, I think Pa had a Western wanderlust. You know, he just didn't uh, like to uh, be around a lot of people. Um, uh, and he wanted to... I think he probably wanted to prove to himself that he could make make it uh, on his own. 
So did Laura begin writing when she was a child? Is there any evidence that she started writing as a kid? Well, uh, there are some examples of her writing uh, when um, uh, she was young uh, in some of the books written about her, uh, but uh, she really didn't start writing what we would call professionally until uh, she came to Mansfield. Um, and I want to jump ahead a little bit because when her family moved to South Dakota, I believe, Laura met her future husband, Almanzo Wilder. Yes. Do, yes. do you know anything about their courtship, what their courtship was like? Well, she talks about his um, meeting at church and uh, then him asking Pa to walk her home. And then he would come uh, every uh, weekend, I think, uh, or some, I can't remember exactly, but he would uh, take her for a ride in his buggy. And she loved going out uh, in the uh, uh, crisp air and, uh, uh, and riding along with El Manzo. And uh, I, I remember that uh, uh, her uh, nemesis, Nellie Olson, uh, also what he liked to ride with with El Manzo. And uh, she went along a few times with him. And one time, Laura told El Manzo when he dropped her off that if he was going to bring Nellie along, he need, the, he need not come by her house to pick her up. <laughs> she was a tough one, right? <laughs> She was. Now, is, now, of course, in the TV show, we know that Laura meets Almanzo because her teacher is Eliza Jane, who was Almanzo's sister. Now, is that accurate? Is, did he have a sister, Eliza Jane? Oh, yes. He had a sister, Eliza Jane. And, um, uh, and she was Laura's sister for a while. I mean, Laura's teacher for a while. And... Uh, uh, Laura had some disagreements with Mrs. Wilder, Miss Wilder, uh, and but uh, I think they later got along since she became Laura's sister-in-law. Um, but uh, Eliza Jane, I think she only taught maybe one term or so uh, at uh, the Smith. So they had a little bit of a rivalry, Eliza Jane and Laura. Yes. Well, you know, Eliza Jane was uh, uh, a few years older than Laura, and uh, of course, being the teacher, I think she thought that she should be the dominant one, and uh, uh, Laura just had, as you pointed out, a strong will of her own, and uh, I think that's where they got into disagreements a lot. So when Laura turned 16, um... I know that she became a teacher. Do you know how long her teaching career lasted? Well, her first um, position was at the uh, Bushy School. In the book, she calls it the Brewster School, but it was really the Bushy, B-O-U-C-H-I-E School. And um, uh, she describes that, uh, you know, she stayed in an uncomfortable situation. She stayed with a family who's, uh, who was uh, near the school. And uh, uh, it, it wasn't, uh, as I said, a comfortable situation. But Almanzo would come and get her every weekend and take her home. So she had a bit of relief on the weekend. And one time, it was even 40 degrees below zero. And he came with his sled to get her. And he had to stop every once in a while to knock the ice off the horse's uh, muzzle so they could breathe. Oh, and then uh, I think she taught two more terms at other schools, but I'm not familiar with those, uh, or I've forgotten. But, um, you know, after uh, a lady got married, you could not teach anymore. Right. Well, that would have been a fun thing to see in the show. I don't think um, we ever got to see El Manzo 
going after her on a sled. But that would, I know. Been, that would have been a good episode. <laughs> That's one of my favorite stories. The first years of the Wilders' marriage were met with a lot of difficulties. Almanzo suffered from diphtheria, which left him paralyzed. And yes. that sort of set into motion a series of unfortunate circumstances. Can you talk a little about that period in their marriage? Well, uh, you know, uh, she um, uh, only married uh, uh, Almanzo uh, because she gave him four, uh, three years to become a successful farmer. She didn't want to marry a farmer at first because she knew how hard they had to work. And, uh, you know, it was just a tough life from all that she had observed. And so um, uh, he, uh, he did promise that he would give her uh, three years. And, um, after the third year, uh, uh, she decided to give him one more. I think they called it in the book a year of grace or something like that. But that's when it really happened. Uh, I mean, all the uh, a lot of the bad things. Their house burned down, and she um, uh, she had a child, but that only lived less than two weeks. Um, uh, and um, uh, it was just. And they had to move to uh, another uh, shed or uh, house that they had. Uh, I think maybe it's the original homestead or something. I can't exactly remember. But um, it was just really difficult. And um, then um, uh, and then Almanzo um, had suffered uh, paralysis from uh, the after the bout of diphtheria. And the cold winters in South Dakota were really um, uh, inhibiting him from uh, uh, working like he wanted to as a farmer. So they moved, moved for a while to uh, the panhandle of Florida, uh, trying to find a warmer climate. But it was really too warm. And so uh, they moved back to Smith for a while uh, and then uh, they heard about the uh, fertile land in Southwest Missouri, and they uh, moved there along with their friends, the Coolies. So in 1894, the, um, they moved to Mansfield, Missouri and purchased property that they would call uh, Rocky Ridge Farm, correct? Correct. And uh, is that where the, was, that's where the museum is? Yes, it is. Uh, and. Uh, and it was aptly named because it is rocky. It, it looks like we grow rocks. They just come out of the ground, <laughs> no matter where you are. Uh, but um, they did uh, come there uh, with the coolies, as I said, and uh, they bought a, a little farm that had a, um, a small cabin on it. Uh, but the cabin wasn't, it had, it was not in the best condition, let's say. And uh, so um, they lived there for a year uh, while uh, uh, oh, uh, cutting down some of the trees around the cabin to make a nice lawn. And then they decided uh, to um, uh, move their, uh, to move their home, um, uh, a little further west. Uh, and so uh, I forgot to mention that they had the next year after they uh, first came, they uh, added on a room to the cabin, uh, just a frame room. And then uh, the next year they decided on a new house site and they took that frame room and put it on skids or logs and rolled it over to the west uh, uh, a few yards, and uh, that's where they started their house with that room and another room and a loft on top for Rose. So, and, and I'm glad you mentioned Rose because I want to get into that. Rose was also a writer, correct? Yes, she now, was. Was she instrumental in Laura becoming a writer? Take us into yes. that period of her life. Yes, definitely. 
uh, Laura had been a writer uh, for a uh, a um, a rural magazine that just had uh, uh, its uh, uh, readers from uh, the local area in Missouri. But uh, Laura had written farm articles and uh, she never did use her name as a byline. She always she started out with, with um, AJ Wilder because she thought that no, no one would read an article from um, uh, uh, or by a lady or wo a woman. And then later on, she started using Mrs. AJ Wilder. But um, then uh, Rose grew up and uh, uh, she, she was first a telegrapher and then she was a real estate person, uh, a realtor, I should say. And then uh, she started freelance writing and her mother uh, thought that was very interesting. And Rose tried for several years to get Laura to write for a better paying market than the Missouri realist. And um, so um, uh, in um, uh, about 19 and 28, when Rose came back from living in Albania, uh, and Rose had been a successful writer throughout the 20s. Uh, she had gone to Europe, first of all, uh, uh, for the American Red Cross to report on the end of World War I. And uh, she ended up staying in, in uh, Europe for a while and came home a couple of times, but then she would go back. But um, uh, in 1928, she came home and built her parents uh, a retirement house that we call uh, the Rock House because it, it has the uh, rock facade on the outside. And uh, well, I mean, Rose just wanted to give her parents a nice, comfortable place to live with all the modern conveniences that were available at that time. And she had the money because she, as you pointed out, she had written uh, a lot of articles and uh, she had ghost written books for people. Uh, and those were later published after the serial uh, uh, was finished. Uh, and uh, so she had saved quite a bit of money and she uh, built the um, rock house with the money that she received from writing a book entitled Cindy, which was like a Hatfields McCoy uh, topic from the Ozarks. Uh, and that is, uh, when um, uh, Laura started writing for uh, a little uh, better um, uh, paying uh, positions. And then, uh, as we all know, uh, after 1928, uh, when, uh, in October, the stock market crashed and poor Rose lost, uh, I think, almost all of her money that she had saved during that time. And so, as I tell my guests, uh, I'm a docent, by the way, at the Wilder home. And uh, as I tell my guests, Rose was stuck in Mansfield, for lack of a better term. But she continued to write. Rose was living in the farmhouse and Laura and Almanzo were living in the rock house. And, uh, Rose continued to write for herself to build her bank account back up, I suppose. And then that's when she encouraged her mama, uh, Mama Bess, as she called her, to write down those uh, stories that Rose had been told all of her life. Uh, and uh, so Mama Bess did. Uh, she wrote her memoir and called it um, Prairie Girl. But um, uh, when submitting it to the publishing world in New York, uh, it was not accepted for various reasons. But one uh, editor, Virginia Kirkus, uh, suggested that Laura rewrite those stories in third person and um, use um, uh, and write it for children's literature. And so, uh, after uh, you know, revising them, and Rose did edit 
her work. And I know a lot of people complain uh, about that Rose may have changed the meaning uh, of some of uh, Laura's um, uh, writings, but uh, I think not because Laura was a very strong-willed person, just as her daughter Rose. But in my opinion, I would have, I'm glad that Rose edited her work rather than someone in New York that didn't know Laura at all and didn't have the chance to converse with her about those editorial changes. And there have also been some rumors that Rose was actually the writer, the ghost writer of the Little House book series. So can you can dispel those rumors. It was not Rose who wrote those books. <laughs> no, uh, and I can't because, uh, and I think it's because Rose ghost wrote you know, several books for other people like Henry Ford and Jack London and, and those people. But when we have the tablets that Laura, and I don't say penned because she penciled, she penciled her words on there. Uh, you can't dispute that Laura was the actual author. So how close was Laura's life to the Little House series, the book series? Well, um, as Laura once told an audience, I think it was in Detroit, when one of the uh, few uh, uh, times that she made talks as an author, she told them, told them that um, all that she wrote in her books uh, was the truth, but sometimes maybe it wasn't the whole truth. Can, can you talk to me a little bit about the end of the Wilder's life? their lives together. Now, Almanzo did die first. Yes, he did. He died in uh, 1949, and Laura died in 1957. They both were living, uh, uh, they had moved back to the uh, farmhouse after uh, the economic uh, situation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, after living uh, in Mansfield for seven and a half years, I guess Rose just couldn't take it anymore or something, I don't know. But she ended up uh, moving uh, uh, back to the New York area uh, after living in Columbia, Missouri uh, for a short time. And, um, uh, and then that left the Wilders, I guess, with uh, two homes to maintain during the depression in 1937. And so, um, they decided to move back to the uh, to the farmhouse and then rent out the rock house, and uh, so they did that. And they um, uh, they sold it to uh, a private uh, a family in 1943, and the rock house was held in. Uh, uh, private hands until 1990 when the uh, Wilder Association bought it back. Um, but uh, back to the story of Laura and Almanzo. Uh, uh, some people think that Laura did not like living in the rock house at all. But if you were to tour the rock house and see how wonderful it is, uh, uh, I'm sure she enjoyed living there but she probably missed her, uh, her farmhouse because she had designed and helped build every inch of that house. And that was her house. Um, so they did move back and um, that's where uh, they died. Uh, in, as I said, El Manzo in 49 and Laura in 57. And then um, while, um, Laura was living there. Uh, I think a book was published uh, like an author's who's who and had Laura's name in it and maybe her address or something. Highway 60 went right by their house and people would just stop off of Highway 60 and come to the door and knock on the door and uh, want to talk to Laura and, and uh, uh, see her house. So uh, Laura would let them in uh, and uh, uh, visit with them for a while. So I think that gave some of Laura's friends and Rose 
an idea to open the house up as a museum after Laura died. And so, um, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, the uh, property had been sold as a reverse mortgage earlier, and that meant that the Wilders could live in the home until they passed away, and then uh, the home was to be passed on to the uh, uh, the purchaser of the land. Well, uh, Rose bought back the land, or not the land, bought back the house and a few acres of land around the house. And um, it be, uh, the house became the first museum three months after Laura passed away with all her authentic things in there. And uh, we are so privileged to, to have those uh, things to share with people. Yeah, that's amazing that people can go in there and really get to know her just by yes. looking at all of the furnishings and all of the, uh, the where she lived, which is, uh, I love, I love literary pilgrimages. So someday I got to, I have to come to Missouri and tour the, the home. Well, um, you, now as for the TV show, uh, do the cast members ever come up to the museum? Do they ever have a reunion up there? Well, they don't have a reunion here. They have a reunion in uh, Walnut Grove uh, and <laughs> It's rather ironic that they had the reunion in Walnut, Walnut Grove. Well, maybe it isn't because um, the Walnut Grove location uh, wasn't even mentioned as a, a town. It was just mentioned as a town in Laura's books. She didn't mention Wal Walnut Grove. And so the museum there was not established until after the TV show started. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, Plum Creek is a, a couple of miles north, but um, uh, uh, they uh, have a lot of cast reunions um, and uh, people, and they have a wonderful Laura show every uh, summer there uh, during July. Uh, it's, it's a magnificent professional almost production. Uh, I was astounded at the sets and everything. But um, uh, as far as um, the, the Mansfield location, we have uh, annually uh, Wilder Days, uh, a weekend uh, that uh, the town celebrates Laura and Almanzo and, and um, uh, we have special events at the Wilder home, at the farmhouse, and we do have several, we have had several uh, of those um, characters come down and visit us and uh, uh, be the, uh, the guest speaker or something like that. Uh, Dean Butler has uh, come several times and Allison Arngram, she's a hoot, by the way, and, uh, uh, and uh, several others uh, that uh, have passed on um, before I started working there. And just recently, uh, uh, Melissa Gilbert and her husband were passing through Mansfield on their way back from visiting their uh, grandson in Texas. And they called and uh, we had a private meeting with her. her I mean, we, the employees, uh, and the director uh, had a private meeting with her after hours and she got to take a tour of the houses and look at the museum and everything. And I think she was quite impressed. One of the things I'm curious about, and I don't know if you'll know the answer to this one, Willa Cather, who wrote My Antonia, one of my favorite writers. And of course she wrote about the frontier and the pioneer experience. Do you know if Laura was familiar with Willa Cather at all? I haven't read anything that Laura has mentioned about her. And there may be uh, some instances that I just, you know, I ha I'm not acquainted of. Uh, but uh, I think Laura wrote her stories just 
Well, she wanted the children to know. Uh, and by the way, when uh, when she wrote her stories, they came out during the Depression. And so the royalties weren't great at all. And But her notoriety was because people were reading the books from the libraries. And of course, the children were bringing them home from schools. Uh, and so her mail increased drastically uh, and they even had to get a larger mailbox uh, because the the mail was so abundant but um, um and i think i think she was proud of that most of all what do you think she would think about the television show do you think she would have been a fan of her life story being turned into a weekly series i really can't say uh, since she never did purchase a television. And even though she died in 1957, you know, she could have, and uh, she had the means to do that, uh, but uh, she didn't. Uh, they have a, um, uh, they had a Philco radio that's on display. I know that, uh, AM of course, but uh, uh, other than that, other than reading and listening uh, to the radio, uh, I don't, I don't know if she even watched TV at another, another person's house. Surely she must have, but I don't know. Um, as far as her, I think, I think she might have been a little upset in that they fictionalized it quite a bit. Right. Um, uh, even though the stories are good moral stories, and I applaud uh, Mr. Landon for uh, making them so. I think she would have been proud of the, that, that, you know, uh, that children uh, still uh, watched the reruns and the parents still do that too. Uh, but um, uh, we all think, of course, the books are much better than the... <laughs> than the TV series. <laughs> yes, the books are always better. We always say that, right? Um, yes. Now, was Laura, is there any evidence of Laura being, um, especially with everything going on today, it makes me wonder with women and everything, was Laura a feminist at all? Was she into women's rights? Well, I really can't say. I remember reading one, uh, interview or one segment uh, about that and I, I can't, it's been so long uh, I read so much about Laura any tangent of Laura Delmanzo uh, I try to read it but uh, I don't think that she was very vocal about uh, the women's rights uh, she just I think she just thought that a woman deserved to be a partner in the marriage right. uh, no matter what and and you know she was instrumental in uh, a lot of several um things in mansfield for instance she helped start the first farm loan association there in the community and she was the secretary treasurer for a long time uh she did run for an office at one time uh but she did not win the election. Uh, but uh, I think that she ran on the Democratic ticket and uh, in Southwest Missouri, uh, we are mostly Republicans. So that may be why she didn't win. What can people expect to, to see when they come to the Laura Ingalls Wilder Home and Museum? Well, we, I am so proud to represent uh, the uh, museum, museum and homes. We have a state-of-the-art museum. Um, we have hospital uh, and a lot of people, uh, tears come to their eyes when they see hospital uh, or when they walk across the threshold of the uh, farmhouse uh, because um, uh, those stories have meant so much to them growing up. But in the museum, we have, as I said, Pa's fiddle. We have a lot of Laura's clothes that she made for, her, for herself. And uh, uh, we have it uh, arranged in chronological order according to the books that she wrote. Uh, and we have 
for instance, uh, Almanzo's shoes that he made for himself because his uh, the right side of his body, you know, was partially paralyzed and that made his right foot smaller than the left foot. And so he had to make his own shoes because his feet were two different sizes. Uh, and then we have her name cards and we have all those uh, things that she talks about in her books. Not all those things, but a lot of things. And uh, uh, I don't know how she saved all those. Maybe she uh, brought them back from her uh, trips to South Dakota that she went uh, maybe to Pa's uh, uh, funeral or and something like, or maybe they shipped them on the railroad. Um, but um, the uh, house, the farmhouse is uh, just as it was. We have all the things in there that Laura used up until her death. Now, some things may have been moved around and some cosmetic things like curtains and linoleum have been changed. Uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, it's just the same as it was. And when is the museum open? We are open every day, uh, Monday through Saturday. We open at nine and we close at five. And then on Sunday, we open at 12.30 and close at 5. And I may I mention that um, uh, when Rose and Laura were collaborating on the books, uh, they, Rose uh, and Laura would walk over the hill back and forth from the rock house to the farmhouse and vice versa. And we now have a path, a paved path that symbolizes uh, that little trick that they made. Oh, that's amazing. It what is. A, what a wonderful legacy to such a great American writer. Ms. Bristol, thank you so much for being on Tea with Tara. I really appreciate this fascinating glimpse into the life of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Well, it has been my pleasure. I, uh, I love Laura and her story and it's in my heart and I just, love to share it with everyone. And I hope to get out there soon. And so if anybody is watching this um, episode and you are a fan of Laura Ingalls Wilder, please head on down to Missouri and see the Laura Ingalls Wilder Historic Home and Museum. Thank you. Thank you very much.